afternoon session to learn around conversion rate optimization. Um, if you can't hear me, please just use the chat box and, and let us know. That'd be much appreciated. Um, but I've got a couple of people nodding, so I'd assume we're, we're all good. Um, what we're going to be covering today. is the following agenda. So just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, so my name is Gary Nissim. I'm the Managing Director of Pinzega Digital. Um, I won't be taking this presentation. Uh, the training or the this session will be available on the same link on Zoom afterwards. Uh, there's a number of tools that we reference in the session. Uh, again, they'll be available in uh, the Zoom recording of the, the webinar. Um, and if you've got any questions, uh, please use the Q&A or chat session as we go along. Um, and if you're an Indago customer, client, um, please get in contact with your account manager. So a quick intro to today's speaker, Chris Hubble. Uh, we won't be going much into uh, Bayesian methodology, uh, but I'm sure if you want to have a chat with Chris afterwards, he'd be more than happy to help. Uh, but I'll pass you on to Chris now, who will start taking you through the, today's presentation. Awesome. Thanks, Gary. So I thought we'd start off today um, talking about kind of what is CRO, or conversion rate optimization. Um, so there's a bit of mysticism around it. Um, so I think we'll, we'll just get some definitions out of the way to start with. Um, so first off, you know, what is a conversion? Um, really any action that's of interest on your website. So if you think about e-commerce, it might be purchase of a product. Uh, if you think about some kind of newsletter promotion, you know, signing up for that newsletter. Um, but it could also be more simple things around clicking a button or spending a certain amount of time on a page. So then we have our conversion rate. And that is the total number of these conversions or desirable actions divided by the total visits to the page. Um, so it's a percentage um, in Google Analytics, you know, you might think about this as a goal completion divided by the number of sessions. In Google Ads, you talk about conversions divided by clicks. So then we get onto what actually is CRO or conversion rate optimization. So there's a lot of factors that go into a CRO project. You know, it's a little bit of science, it's a little bit of maths, um, there's some design in there, um, but really, you know, CRO is about identifying roadblocks on your user's path to conversion. So what's stopping them from taking those desirable conversion actions? And then we smooth out those sort of problem areas and hopefully increase that number of conversions that people take. Cool. So who does CRO work for? Really, the one question that you have to ask yourself is, is your conversion rate at 100%? And I think for, for almost everyone in this call, that'll be a no. Um, ideally, you know, your conversion rate, you're always improving it. Um, you know, you're working towards uh, attaining uh, a higher conversion rate through this testing process. So there's a few key things you need um, before you start on the process. Um, first off, you need a website that receives some kind of traffic, um, editable pages, um, and some kind of development resource to kind of build out a new page. Um, the ability to measure those conversion actions that we spoke about before, and then hopefully a great methodology and approach uh, from Indego Digital. Um, but even with just a few of those elements, you know, we can put together a CRO project, um, but ideally yeah, you'd have most of those um, key elements. So why is CRO so effective at driving growth? So I think the key thing to call out here is we're talking about a large effect. So I know a lot of you are running, you know, highly optimized kind of paid media campaigns, um, social campaigns, 
Um, really the improvements you can get out of, out of making optimizations at that level, you know, you're talking one or 2% improvements there. Um, with CRO, you know, we're talking more around 10, 20, 30% improvements um, in conversion rate. And, and that flows onto all of your channels. So if you think you implement a change on one of your landing pages that you're using for social and for paid, um, then that will improve the results of those channels as well. So we're talking about large effects that is that kind of across your whole website. So then I think we'll dive into, you know, how does this actually work? What is this process um, that we go through to optimize our conversion rate? So these are kind of the top level points um, and we'll dive into each of these in a bit more detail. So first off, we need to identify our conversion action. So what is it that we want to increase on our website? And I've listed a few criteria on the left here, which is kind of a good way to think about these um, conversion points. But any of you who have Google Analytics set up, you know, you'll have some um, you know, goals in there or conversion actions um, that aren't necessarily too relevant. So I've just highlighted as an example here, you, know, you might have an old conversion point that you're not tracking anymore. Um, you might have a PDF download, which you know, shows some intent, but isn't really a hardcore conversion action. And then you'd want to identify, you know, what are your actual conversions that relate to, you know, your business objectives um, and that are actually valuable to you as a business. Sorry, sorry to jump in, Chris. So surely the, the conversion that you should be measuring would depend on the page that you're, you're changing, the, the page that you're testing against? Yeah, 100%. If you think, um, you know, in an e-commerce situation, you know, you might be looking at a product page. Um, and so your conversion action then would be purchases or add, add to carts. Whereas if you have like a, a blog post, um, then maybe you're pushing for newsletter signups. So think about, yeah, the relationship, not only between your business and the conversion points, but between the actual page itself and the content and who's reaching that page and what action, you know, they're expecting to take. So once we've identified our conversion point or conversion points, we then want to understand, you know, where are those roadblocks that we talked about before? So first step is to collect some data. Um, most of you will be familiar with Google Analytics. Um, that's usually our starting point. We'll have a look at different pages on the website and how users are kind of moving through those pages. Um, so things that we're looking for is, um, you know, conversion rate percentages um, for a particular page, bounce rates, how many people are leaving the website from those pages. Um, and what we should see is that, um, you know, there are certain pages where people get to it and they don't continue on down our conversion path. Um, so once we've identified these pages, you know, we hone in on these pages, that's what we're going to base our test around. So Chris, I mean, obviously here you're, you're intimating that you, you'd use a tool like Google Analytics to understand the page that you should test, but <clears throat> in your experience, um, I'd assume there's certain pages that you always seem to test. Can you, can you let us know what they are? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think for the most part, what we look at is, you know, high traffic, high volume pages. Um, they've got kind of two advantages. One, you get a lot of data through them. Um, and two, they're often kind of your key pages. So things like paid search landing pages are a great place to start because you're sending, you're paying to send people to that page um, and usually yeah, high volume and there's lots of people who are going to take your action. So obviously high volume means that there's a, the percentage increase will make a larger difference to your bottom line. Because yeah. a high volume page, a landing page is a good starting point. Exactly, yeah. If you were to test, say, if you were to start your test at the very end of the funnel, um, you know, maybe on your final page of adding your credit card details, you know, you're missing out on adding all those people originally um, to get into the funnel process. So once we've identified um, kind of our area of interest on the website, then we need to start developing a variant for that page. So the first thing we start off with is some more data collection. So now that we've narrowed in on you know, the page that we actually want to look at, we'll use a tool like uh, Crazy Egg or Hotjar um, to actually look at how users are interacting with the page itself. 
Um, so on the right here, you know, we've got a, a kind of some examples of, of the readouts we get from these tools. Um, so this first one here is, is kind of like a scroll map or a heat map. We can see kind of the high interest areas of the page. So the, the whites and the yellows and the reds are highly, highly viewed, whereas the cooler colors are less viewed. So instantly this tells us, you know, okay, the top of the page is of interest to people. That's where people are landing. They're spending their time there. But as we move down the page, we lose people. But then there's these other elements here, which appear to be of interest. So we want to, we want to understand what those things are and take those into consideration when we're building our new design. Um, likewise, on the right here, we've got a kind of a confetti or a heat map of where people are clicking. Um, so again, we're able to identify, you know, these are the key you know, sort of USPs that people are interacting with that they're looking at. And then in the FAQ section, you know, we can see that there's certain questions that people are clicking on. We understand then that that, that information is important to them. So let's make that more prominent in our design. The next thing we'd want to have a look at is competitors. So you'd want to look at your direct competitors in the local market, but also, you know, look globally. Um, Australia is generally a pretty unique and smaller market. Um, there's a lot more advanced and developed markets globally that we can kind of tap into, see what they're doing and maybe take some learnings from their designs and adapt that into our own. And then finally, you would actually design the page. Um, so taking all of this research, um, all of this data collection and, and kind of bundling it together and, and using a, a, a designer to create a new design, which kind of satisfies all of these problems you've identified. So Chris, it, it sounds like you're not making small changes. We're not changing color of button. You're really, you're changing the whole page in, in totality. Is that correct? Yeah, I think as a starting point and, and where you, you can see the kind of the biggest change um, is making these dramatic changes to a page. So, you know, there might be some merit in a button being red versus blue, um, but those percentage increases or decreases are going to be so small um, you'd be much better off changing the entire layout of a page, really getting experimental with it. Um, and I think the advantage of that is it's a more significant result. So, you know, even if it was a worse performing design, you'd learn that really quickly because the results would be so different. Perfect, thanks. So once we have our design, um, our next step is to test that design. So there's a couple of ways you can do this, um, but the first step is we do a pretest. Um, so before committing, you know, kind of resource and time and money into actually developing the HTML page that's going to live on the website, um, we just create the design in Photoshop and we take an image of the two designs, our original web page and our new variant design, which we call the control is the original and the variant is the new design. And we run these through a survey group. So we ask the group, which page are they more likely to convert through? Um, and then we get a response back from them. And this is really powerful because it tells us if we're on the right track. So instantly we get a sense of, you know, are we, are we designing a page that satisfies these needs or have we missed the mark? Did we misinterpret the data? And really, you know, we're making a worse design. And it's a really good sort of checkpoint where we can then return back to our design stage if we have to, um, and adjust things and, and move things around to make sure that we're, you know, putting forward the best design that we can. Um, so when we do this pretest, uh, Chris, can we uh, make sure that the, the, the people that are doing the, the pretest are the kind of the right customers for our client? Is there a way of doing yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. So can we use our clients? customers themselves? Yeah, ideally, um, yeah, if you if you have a list of, of you know, existing customers or previous customers, um, you know, you know that they're kind of the perfect market to test with this. Um, if that's not something that's available, then what we usually do is we take data from Google Analytics or from your internal data sources and match those demographics, um, you know, income, age, gender, things like that education level um, and bundle that all together and, and find a user group that kind of fits that, um, that demographic of your converting users. Perfect. Cool. Um, so the information we get back from that is, yeah, is kind of some commentary. Um, you know, you can see on the right here, we've got an example. Um, we can see that people have pointed out that their ease of use of the site has improved. 
Um, they've highlighted the imagery being more prominent and friendly. Um, it's clearer, there's more information. All of these different things, you know, just like I said, reaffirm that we're moving in the right direction, that we're kind of achieving what we've set out to do. So once we've got that, then we need to move on to actually testing the page. So at this point, we would build the page in HTML um, and put it onto the website. And then we use a, a tool which we can A-B test through. So um, we lean towards Google Optimize. It has a few advantages over the others. It's free um, for most, almost all use cases um, and it integrates really well with Google Analytics. So your existing conversion points that you're already tracking, you can then track in Google Optimize. Um, we use these tools then to split the traffic between the two pages. Um, so we send 50% of the traffic to the control or the original page, and then 50% of traffic to the variant or the new page. Um, and then we measure the performance of the two pages. So which one converts more? So am I correct in saying if you're using, let's say Google Optimize, as you pointed out to, uh, and the data is being pulled in from Google Analytics, does that mean that if your um, uh, call tracking provider ties them with Google Analytics, you can track phone calls as well? Yeah, and I think that's one of the big advantages. Um, you'll likely have your tracking set up in analytics the way that you want it and the way that you're used to reporting on it. Optimize just takes complete advantage of that. Whereas the other tools, you have to set up those integrations or create their own kind of conversion goals within those platforms. So once we've collected our data, then we need to perform an analysis on that data. And really, there's one question that we need to answer here, and it's which performed better, the variant page or the control page? And the difficulty, and you might remember this from high school maths or uni statistics, um, it's incredibly difficult to say with 100% certainty which one that is. So we like to talk around which one is more likely to be the better performer. Um, and there's a lot of math that goes into that. I won't bore you with that. I know Gary loves a Bayesian uh, model, um, but there's basically two, there's two methods of doing it, uh, which I've linked here if you want to find out some more information about it. Um, yeah, we leaned more towards the Bayesian side because we think it gives a bit more meaningful information. Um, well, just it's, to, to my mind, the, the key thing about Bayesian model, it enables you to reach the statistical significance quicker with a smaller amount of data, is that correct? Yeah, so the traditional methods are, yeah, are based on, on a lot of data. So if you can't hit those kind of, yeah, significant amounts of volume, then yeah, the Bayesian method gives you a faster and, and kind of, yeah, easier approach to it. Okay. Cool. Um, so then once we've made this analysis and we've decided which page um, is the better performer, then we need to implement the page. And then once we've implemented the page, we repeat. So really I think, and the, the power of CRO is, you're not saying that if you're variant one, that it's the best page you could have ever designed. Um, and really that's not the goal to find the best page because I mean, maybe that doesn't exist. Um, but as long as you're improving, that means you can go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what else can we try? And you keep iterating on this, um, in this process and you just keep in making smaller and smaller improvements to your page and it just gets better and better and better. So you can either keep working on the same page or maybe you would have more of an impact if you looked elsewhere on the site. So, you know, we talked before around like a typical kind of e-com funnel. Maybe if you've worked on the start of that funnel, then you look at the next step. Where are people dropping off next in that process? And you might work on that. Cool. Um, so I don't know if we've got any questions on any of that. So we're going to talk about some common myths and mistakes. <clears throat> so it'd be great if any of you have uh, any questions that we need to ask or, or mistakes and or successes you've had in the rationale for that. would be great if you could use uh, the chat box. Um, but uh, Chris will continue to talk through, from what I understand, your, your tips and tricks. Is that yeah, right? some, some hot tips. Hot tips. Coming in. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I thought, yeah, I thought I'd share with you guys just a few kind of starting points. These are the things that, you know, time and time again, um, we come across these as being kind of good jumping off points in, in working on a design. Um, so I think I'll just call out a couple of these, but 
um, short form versus long form pages. So if you think about, um, you know, in SEO, we're trying to get more content on the page and, and long form content is seen as really valuable. Um, if we're sending out paid search traffic to that though, um, and it's high intent, you know, these people are ready to convert, then potentially long form isn't actually the best page to be sending those people to. So often there's a big consideration around how much content we have on this page and really thinking about what, what users are we sending to this page? If it's paid search and they're ready to convert, let's give them a shorter page, much easier to make that conversion action that we're interested in. Another one which comes up a lot is imagery and iconography. Um, you know, it's, it's best practice anyway, but yeah, we find time and time again that imagery really speaks to people. Um, we do things like we look at Google Analytics and we have a look at the demographics of the people who actually convert on your website. Let's make the imagery speak to those people. Um, if they can see themselves using the product or whatever it might be, then they're much more likely to engage with it. There's a question uh, um, around, I heard it's a common myth that CRO is just about changing uh, the color of certain buttons. Is this true for certain industries? That would be like the last step in your process. You might look at, yeah, once you've kind of, you're, you've made these big changes and you're really confident that you're working with some really powerful landing pages, um, yeah, then you might look at, at looking at your button colors. I think the, the most common mistake that we find when we run a CRO campaign or take over a CRO campaign from a client is they test the minutia, mm. the color of the button, a heading, and they go on the basis that the base level page works. And typically the base level page has been built off the back of the design with no thought process, you know, no conversion thought process. So really our whole methodology in Dargo is to basically start from scratch. And actually the change in the color of a button, the first problem is, is that there's probably not enough data between the two to actually test whether that's even successful. Um, and, and then the other problem is, is that um, it's just, you, you just, it's too far down the process. You know, we need to test that base level page basically. Yeah, for sure. The, so Chris, if you look at your starting points, would you say, uh, and this is obviously a leading question, that kind of 80% of what we do kind of utilizes these seven or so points? Yeah, I'd say so. I think almost all of our designs incorporate these elements. Um, obviously a sticky nav or call to action is dependent on how long your page is. Um, but yeah, we, we focus on messaging and the imagery you know, from the start um, and definitely yeah, the length of the content, social proof. Okay. Uh, one other question. So someone said, you mentioned cool tracking, uh, conversion tracking in Google. Please explain further how advantageous is this? Uh, as in, in the context of a CRO test? Oh, well, I think um, I'm, I'm going to hastily guess that what we're saying is well, how important is, is cool tracking? Now, I might just kind of, I think I'll feel it from a general perspective yep. and then maybe from a CRO perspective. Um, if you have a call center or driving calls is critical to your business, then, then having call tracking is, is super important. Mm -hmm. um, specifically in a B2B environment, we find call tracking you know, critical. Yeah. Um, and there are third party providers that you can do call tracking with, um, someone like Delicon or Vansa. And those call tracking providers also hook up into Google Analytics, um, which therefore means that you can have calls measured in Google Analytics, which can then be bought into your test. Because if calls are a key way of you're gonna measure success, you can't run a test without measuring them. Yeah, and I think, yeah, to that point, I guess in the CRO context, um, with some of the other tools, we've had that issue before where we haven't been able to track calls and it's been a key, um, it's been a key kind of measure of success for the client. Um, so yeah, we definitely want that in there if we can get it in there. Cool. And then I thought I'd just include some tips as well. Um, again, just based on the work that we've done previously, you know, these are some things to think about when you're designing a, a test. Um, so I think probably the key one here we've talked about is, is making dramatic changes, um, you know, faster testing, uh, stronger conclusions. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of a great starting point, um, but also testing with paid search um, allows you to control it a bit more easily. Um, you can send people to specific pages, avoids redirecting people on your site as well. Um, we're kind of, we're, we're keen to kind of wrap up because it's, uh, you know, maybe 20, 25 minutes. We've just got another question, which is around, do you find that SEO and, and CRO, um, SEO and CRO teams disagree on what an optimized page should be? And, and if you have a look at Chris's first tip, which is test with paid search, he, he's, he's saying exactly that. 
The problem is, is often a CRO page is a very, it's a smaller page with less on it. So obviously for SEO and the SEO is uh, in the webinar will realize is that long form content is kind of key at the moment in SEO. So when you design a, a, an SEO page that you're doing CRO on, you do not want to lose that ranking. And therefore it's very important not to cut out content that is helping that page rank. And so typically we'll always start with paid channels uh, because it's much more easily controllable. And the other problem with doing a CRO test on an SEO page is in essence, you have two pages potentially showing which gives rise to duplicate content. So it's a much more complex issue uh, where you need kind of the, the test to be served server side as well. So much, much more complex. Uh, but yes, you need to think about it with an SEO hat on as well as a CRO hat. And I think as well to that point, thinking about who are the users that are coming through to that page via paid search or via SEO? Um, and, you know, what page best serves their kind of interests? So, um, yeah, design the page to meet that. I think lastly, we've just got some sort of FAQs, some stuff we've gathered from the internet and, um, you know, heard people say, I think I'll just call out my favorite one here, which is what is a good conversion rate? Um, you know, I, I kind of like to say the only good conversion rate is one that's higher after you've run your CRO test. Um, I think you can compare your site to benchmarks or to things you read in blog posts, um, but really, you know, what you need to think about is can you improve your conversion rate for your users on your website? Um, and really, you know, the best way to do that is, is with CRO. Cool. Is that it for questions? No, so quick next steps and we'll let people go. So yeah, I think like Gary said, the presentation will be available. So yeah, if you want a copy of that, um, send me an email and I can share that with you. Um, if you're interested to find out more, um, please get in touch. You know, we can talk to you in more detail. Um, I can chat to you about Bayesian methodologies if, if that's what you're after. Um, and we'll put a bit of a plan in place about what we can do. Um, and for existing clients, you know, get in touch with your account manager. Um, and yeah, we can, we can see you up a chat. Thanks for your time, everyone. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. Cheers.